Um, so I think I'll just uh, maybe give a little bit of background because I think there, to people who don't know my work at all, um, there might be some uh, some th there might be some context that I could that I could give on that. Um, Jennifer mentioned uh, my uh, living in, in Germany, living in Berlin, and I'll start with that because that that's where a lot of I think that's where a lot of the things that you see in my work, oddly enough, uh, as much as it has to do with, with uh, you could say, with Western Canada, um, as, as much as it, is that, as much as it has to do with those things, uh, a lot of it also has to do with my um, experiences slash informal education, um, living in Berlin, and things that were already leading up to that before I moved there. Um, so. Uh, one of the things before moving to Berlin that I was that I was interested in um, was this idea, you know something that I'm going to I'm going to use the word dis dispersal um, some idea of a kind of dispersed exhibition was was um, what I was sort of working towards when I was a graduate student at the University of Victoria uh, I've been a painter for a long time and that's still my my daily, you know, quasi-daily uh, artistic practice is, is, is uh, basically like a studio-based painter. Um, and um, anyways, uh, but at the same time, when I was doing my, my, my graduate degree, I was, I was looking for other things to do as well. Uh, and I think that just comes out of, for me, comes out of living in Vancouver in the 90s <laughs> as an artist because painting was like low on the list of of anybody's um well anybody's pa pa painting was sort of frowned upon in vancouver by the serious uh cognoscenti and um you know vancouver is like the you know the site of uh, vancouver school of photography and you know what you could call neoconceptual art and really invested in that history of, um, you know, the idea of the end of painting and the, the birth of other ways of making art. And so, so painting was, uh, especially in the 90s there, was seen as being like, you know, um, almost like a non-artist if you're a painter. <laughs> uh, so I have this kind of baggage with me. And uh, I'll call it baggage, but also, you know, it's, in some other sense I might, it's also led to a kind of ex maybe an expanded sense of how the medium can be used, but it certainly led to a, a kind of internal, you know, questioning of, you know, standing there in a room with, you know, colored mud on a paintbrush and moving it around. Um, and, um, but, you know, that's, like I said, that's still what I do. Um, so, going into my, uh, my graduate degree, I was, I kind of did this kind of self-imposed critique of painting on myself. I wasn't necessarily getting it in the program, um, but I was looking for other things or ways to make work that was more serious or ways to make work that was more something. Um, anyway, so I, after that I got this painting award uh, and I, I moved to Berlin for two years and, and a lot of the things that I had started to get interested in when I was living in Victoria, uh, I really saw it kind of all around me there. Um, you know, different ways of thinking about painting as, as a kind of installation medium. Um, thinking about uh, a way of making art that is not so invested in uh, the perpetual um, stamp of the artist's persona, but maybe using different styles, uh, using different mediums. Um, that was all sort of, all those interests of mine were, were sort of reinforced um, when I was living in, in Germany. So that was a really fruitful time um, living there and taking in a lot of influences. And when I, when I look at the images that I've assembled, um, I do see a lot of it as almost like a building of the subject matter and uh, ways of using materials. Um, it's almost like the exhibitions could be seen as, as, as research into how to, how to make art, how to still be a painter, but do other things as well. Um, so the other thing that I can say about living in uh, Germany is that I, I, um, I started this body of work, which is now 
seems like it's moving into a, a kind of trilogy <laughs> of, of uh, thinking about the cowboy and thinking about the kind of colonial narrative and thinking about, um, you know, uh, this kind of Western expansion narrative of North America. And the reason why I ha happened upon this theme in Germany, uh, one of the reasons, was because Germans love cowboys. Um, and that was a surprise to me. Um, so much so, in fact, that I think still to this day that the best-selling German author is now a long-dead author named Karl, Karl May, we would say in English, Karl May, um, who in the late 19th century um, started publishing these books, um, basically cowboy and Indian stories, and publishing them for a German audience. So these were German language books. Um, and, uh, and he sparked this whole kind of passion in Germany, and that was, I think, around 1905, uh, for these kinds of narratives. And um, so the work that, you know, still to, to some extent you see downstairs is still kind of thinking, it's not thinking about that in the German context, um, but it's, it's thinking about that, those kinds of narratives as having both like this kind of dual character of fiction and, and reality, basically. And, and I think, you know, probably what you may have noticed in that exhibition is this play between those two, those two um, ideas. And I think a part of that for me just comes from, um, you know, when I try to think Canadian history or North American history, uh, those movies just kind of find their way into my head, movies that I grew up watching. Um, and, and I think it's something to do with the fact that the European um, past here is so recent that it basically coincides with the beginning of, you know, photography and soon to be followed by cinema. Um, okay, so that's maybe a bit of a, a um, tangent, but hopefully it, it gives some ideas into, into what the work is about. So this show um, then that I'm going to start with here from 2009, um, I called it the Greenhorn. And it was meant to sort of play with this dual um, recognition of the self as other or recognition of a Western Canadian as possibly holding some kind of exotic appeal for Germans. Um, and the term greenhorn, uh, I should also briefly explain for anybody who doesn't know, it is a kind of cowboy slang vernacular for, you know, somebody who's new at something somebody who's green. I think it comes from cattle ranching or something. Um, okay. So this, uh, uh, this is a still from one of these German films, um, which, which I just, I, I liked its kind of abject quality. Um, and in, interwoven throughout this is also, is, you know, reflections on, on masculinity and the kind of masculine archetypes that those Western films, um, try to uphold or try to present. Um, and here you have this kind of stuffed dummy um, shot in Yugoslavia, by the way, uh, not in Wyoming or, or uh, anywhere in the United States. Um, that's where the German Westerns were, were shot. Uh, and then I, you know, so this, I'm, I'm going to now go into, that was, this was basically the, um, this was the invitation for the exhibition. And, uh, and now I'm going to go show, I'll show you some of the work that was in that show. Um, and again, thinking about this notion of a dispersed exhibition format, something that was, includes paintings, something that includes authored works, things that I made, as well as kind of appropriated works. Um, and and I, I put it in shorthand sometimes for people, you know, my solo shows sometimes look like group shows. Um, so... I did this watercolor where I was playing with this, this kind of deflated image and, and dropped him into a, into a, an uh, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner composition, who's a German expressionist painter. And so there's always this kind of things that don't belong, and I, and I try to work with things that maybe shouldn't go together and find, find a way to, to make them go together. So this was this gallery in Berlin. So along with... Uh, 
along with some some ready-made paintings or sorry along with what I showed there I also showed these these what I called ready-made paintings which were textiles um, Navajo uh, inspired designs which were woven in France which I came across in a store in Vancouver so again embodying this kind of idea of displacement uh, and maybe um, appropriation at the same time I also uh, I, I did I remade uh, a sort of iconic piece of um, 20th century furniture design, uh, the Berlin Chair by Garrett Rietveld. And I, I kind of remade it and took it, t took it apart in the exhibition and, and used it as a kind of sculpture along with these, with these German Western stills. Okay, so, the, so we have the two, um, the two halves of that Rietveld, uh, Garrett Rietveld Berlin Chair. Here's the second half. Uh, in both cases, I uh, used them as a kind of abstract form and combine them with the, with the Western stills and also with, uh, in this case, with cowboy um, pulp paperback novels by Louis L'Amour. These were some paintings that I showed uh, in the same exhibition. And um, this is sort of, in generally, I mean, even the paintings that are downstairs, uh, you know, similar size, uh, basically taking on some kind of uh, you know, basic realist position in painting and putting those up with other, you know, putting those up against other objects. Um, so I was playing with these, um, these images which I got from the uh, Wild West Portrait Studio in Victoria, BC. So I was uh, living and teaching in Victoria at the time when this, you know, when I was making the work for the show. And uh, so one day I walked into one of these places, into this portrait studio, you know, this kind of tourist, the kind of portrait studios where they take a photo of you and, and you know, present it as a kind of sepia-toned artifact. Um, and I walked in and asked the, asked the guy who was working there to take a whole series of pictures of me getting into costume. So these, these, paint, these paintings came from those photographs. So there's a play with, you know, a play with identity as well. <coughs> Um, so it's a self-portrait on the left, and then also treating it, treating them as as still life paintings as well. And I titled these small reenactments. So I was thinking as well about the idea of a historical reenactment. And again, thinking of them, thinking of them as as. Um, Thinking of the set in those photos as, as a series of still lifes as well. So pulling that kind of content out of it. And I placed it in relation to this um, into a, maybe a, a kind of little, little known work by uh, the Arte Povera artist Yanis Kunelis, which uh, this kind of great piece where he used cactuses. So I was thinking about, um, you know, again, thinking about about you know it's like it's, it's it's like a spaghetti western almost or something like that or it's a it's a the play between between this uh, between you know European ideas and North American ideas uh, the larger paintings um, and quasi paintings in that show so the, the larger paintings and the uh, ready made paintings were all shown leaning against the wall and again you see that in the show downstairs um, so it's a way for me of thinking about um, you know, showing small, like making these small uh, representational paintings and showing them with a, with a very different kind of painting. And uh, so playing with that in the, in the way the works are installed. Um, so these were resting on slats. And um, I think I was also interested with these, with these larger paintings on the slats and, you know, in, in trying to push push painting into a, into a into a different kind of situation than it's, than it's normally in and thinking about a painting as an object as a kind of everyday object so this this one in particular you know again I was I was thinking with a, um, I was making this work uh, in Germany and thinking about a German audience uh, so it's uh, this piece is based on a on the work of a uh, German neo-expressionist painter named George Baselitz, uh, who makes paintings upside down. It's kind of his signature. 
And if you look at, if you see this painting as an upside down painting, then you can see the figure in it um, connected to that, that self-portrait. Okay, here's a, a, a close-up shot of one of the textile paintings. Um, like, uh, also on the slats with a novel. And um, I think this, this piece, you can also think of the large painting downstairs, um, the one called um, Large Catalog Reproduction, which is a sort of one-to-one -one painting of the cover of the, of the WAG catalog. Um, it's a way of, uh, with this one in particular, I wanted to position it almost so that, uh, well, so that it would be the first thing that people saw when they came into the gallery. And thinking of this page as being something that structures the rest of the show. And one way that I, um, that I see, that I liken that to in my own mind is, is uh, you know, in certain, certain films where they'll, they'll open the film with a scene of a, a hand turning a page to kind of situate the film within a kind of literary context. So I saw it as having a kind of structuring relationship to the exhibition as a, as a, as a sort of storytelling. And it's a page, it's a page out of um, the first Karl May Western. And it's a page where he explains what a greenhorn is. It's also a, a large um, mistranslation I took the German text and I ran it through Google Translate and I put it, using Photoshop, put it back onto this large scanned page. Um, so it looked like a real outtake from a novel, but it's in fact this kind of garbled, you know, displaced narrative, let's say. That's that show. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna move forward a few years uh, to a show that was at the Southern Alberta Art Gallery in 2013 uh, in Lethbridge. And you could think of this as, you know, you could think of this show as being part two of the other show. Um, and again, it's, well, I think it's, uh, if anything, it, I think it amplifies some of those uh, ideas of dispersal that I talked about, uh, using a lot of different materials, um, using a lot of different uh, mediums. And in this case, really e explicitly, I think, um, treating the gallery as a stage. Okay, so this is also where I first, where I first um, made the decision to borrow these, these two Frederick Remington sculptures. Uh, so that's Bronco Buster on the left and Mountain Man on the right. If you think about the show, the, the other work that I just showed in Germany, you can see uh, that I was thinking about the work in relation to that place. And uh, and in this case, that became, um, you know, e an even more clear sort of idea for me that, that I could link this whole exhibition in a way to the a sort of mythology of, of Southern Alberta. Um, and that's what led me to using, to borrowing these two sculptures. I think there's a, there's a kind of collecting class in Alberta. Uh, you know, people who have some money and want to buy some art and because of the, the sort of, you know, the mythology of, of Alberta as being, you know, a kind of Texas of the North and, and the reality of, of ranching there, they gravitate towards these kinds of objects. So, you know, it's, it's a kind of play with, uh, with a kind of local mythology, I guess you could say. Um, and borrowing those Borrowing those works also, you know, led, led to other ideas. And I think that's the way I kind of structure my exhibitions, is I come up with a kind of constellation of ideas and f find ways to connect them together. Um, so I was thinking about these sculptures as being objects. Uh, I was thinking about their relationship to, to value um, and, and, and to wealth, and then also on to, to colonialism and uh, you know, that, that westward expansion narrative that I mentioned earlier. And then I also, you know, the, the, uh, the stage lights is also a way of thinking about uh, theater and film as well. So this is the exhibition in which I first 
in which I first hired actors as well. So we're going to take we're going to finish taking a look at at this show, and then I'll show a, a five minute excerpt from this performance, which is quite different from the one downstairs. Um, in fact, that was when I when I originally talked to Jennifer about showing the uh, the work here. Um, you know, we talked about having some kind of local reflection in the version of the show here. And my first thought was to, was to change the, you know, that the performance was, would actually be a, um, you know, a, a relatively easy way of, of changing location in a way. Uh, and then it turns out that I made, I made new work as well that also reflects this place. So, um, so I, decided to, I decided to hire two actors and uh, which is a really interesting process. Um, I had never done anything like that before, and I don't really have a, a background in uh, in theater and film and performing arts. I, I have no background in that. I've played in a band, uh, which is about you know as close as I get to being on stage. But you know, you're not reciting lines and thinking about narrative and dialogue and all of those things. Um, so it was really a um, a jump into something that I had no experience with. Uh, but I think that I was generally kind of excited about that. Um, of course, also a little bit, um, I don't know, like had some trepidation about it as well. Uh, having known, like, <laughs> having very little knowledge of theater, I, I didn't, I mean, I knew there were things that I wanted to avoid, um, but couldn't really, you know, couch those things in any kind of great knowledge of theater. Um, so I took a, I think I posted an ad on, I think it was on Kijiji, because I was making the work here. I wasn't in Lethbridge. And then the gallery, at the Southern Alberta Art Gallery, they helped me out quite a bit as well. And I think it was, I think it was the gallery that wound up finding these two great local actors, um, Kathy Zaborski and Andrew Merrigan. Uh, another way, another, another reason, um, another kind of roundabout way that I came that I came, came about this decision to work with actors was actually through thinking about objects. Um, one of the things that's developed uh, in my work is, you know, a relationship between sculpture and painting. But I don't, I would never call myself a, a sculptor. Maybe, maybe in a couple of years or something I, I may come to that. Um, and the reason being is because I, w when I make sculpture, I, I usually just find things and put them together. So it's really in the, in the assemblage kind of tradition, um, you know, collage, assemblage, Robert Rauschenberg, or somebody like that might, might come to mind. Um, so I was thinking about um, that process, about putting things together. And I was thinking about exhibitions and, and you know, how over the course of, of uh, well, I guess you could say over the course of, of modernism, you know, this, you have this idea of the found object and these um, sort of arbitrary, people putting arbitrary things together and, and calling it an, an assemblage or an exhibition. And so one of the ways that, that I wanted to think about these objects is that they could be, they could look arbitrary uh, in the exhibition, but they could also take on a different narrative uh, life, you could say. Um, when an actor comes in and uses it, uses it as a prop. So the, the decision to, to work with actors, um, I think, came out of that, that idea of, you know, um, for 20 days, it's an exhibition of maybe seemingly random, some seemingly random looking objects. And on that 21st day, let's say, uh, it all gets linked together through this kind of performed narrative. Uh, so, um, I think that's the best way I can describe coming to that idea of working with actors. Like I said, it's, it's not from having a background in theater. Uh, so this is another still. A little, a little, uh, heads up about the title. I've, I haven't quite settled on a title for that performance. Um, the show is called uh, performance with two sculptures and at one point I was calling the performance that as well and then at one point I, st I started to call it the preparators so it kind of has two names 
right now. Um, that will get figured out at some point. Um, okay, uh, so this is, there are two things here that I want to, or two things here that I want to touch on. The image on the left, you'll see it in an exhibition context in a second. So the image on the left is actually, uh, it's an artwork. Uh, it's a photograph of uh, a detail of the book on the right. And when I was making this show, I was thinking about this idea, you know, obviously thinking about this idea of the cowboy, which led me to the idea of colonialism and, and Alberta. And I felt like at some point I had to, I had to think about, you know, um, real, no, real notions of displacement and having to do with, with indigenous issues in Canada. And uh, so I came across, you know, part of, my, part of my research, I often pick up like books that most people really wouldn't want to spend much time with. Um, and uh, I came across this book, and I came across this text in the book on the left. Um, the completion of the new grandstand provided improved accommodation for stampede patrons and racing fans, including restaurant facilities and the Glaston area, making year-round operation possible. It also made it possible to move the Indian village to more commo commodious quarters across the Elbow River in a park-like setting. So I came across these these images and these uh, these image descriptions, and it, it just struck me that that this was a kind of an, an unintentional displacement reenactment uh, taking place within within the Calgary Stampede, not one with grave consequences, but uh, it allowed me to kind of think about that content within the context of my exhibition, uh, which had a lot of sort of play with models and reenactments. Um, stand-ins for real events, but representations of real events. So I wound up making these two, what I, what I called history paintings, and so calling them that enabled me to think of them as being very large, because if you think of the, um, the examples of history painting we have, like the Raft of the Medusa by Jerry Coe, uh, or Liberty Leading the People, those would be the two sort of famous examples. Um, they have that sort of large um, public address as opposed to the smaller intimate scale of some of the other paintings. So I paired, I paired these, these large paintings of the, of the book spread, and you can see my finger in the painting kind of holding the book down. Um, I paired them with the photographs of the text that actually appeared in the book um, as a way of, of talking about that, that aspect of uh, this narrative, this expansion narrative, expansionist narrative. Um, so these, these were based on photographs that I just took in my studio. And I also wanted to play with the idea of, you know, what counts as a history painting. You know, on the one hand, you have the real event. On the other hand, you have the event as it's already been captured and reproduced. So I call them um, history paintings one and two. So here's history painting one. Displacements, part A, part B being the photograph of the text. Um, and there's history painting uh, two displacements, again, part A. So they're both, they're both paintings of Calgary, but they're paintings of Calgary as found in that book called The Hundred Years of the Calgary Stampede. Uh, and they show the um, the movement of the Indian village to more commodious quarters across the Elbow River. And there you can see them next to each other. So that's just the second of the texts. Um, both of the texts, they look similar, um, and they basically say the same thing, but they use sli slightly different language. It was out of this show that the, this idea of the figure of Cura, which is this Roman goddess who is, um, you know, the source of the word curate and the source of the word care, um, came out of this exhibition as well. So I think that finds its way in the exhibition downstairs, obviously uh, developed and fleshed out. And you can see the relationship between the, 
the uh, performance in the paintings. Um, for, the, for the performance downstairs, the, that whole section, or that whole passage, I should say, the first passage in the performance, the first act, um, where, the, where the two actors are touching the objects. I mean, in, in a way, I, I thought of those collages behind the actors that are on the wall, the photo collages. I thought of those as almost being a script for that, for that uh, section of the performance. So I'm interested in this kind of, you know, how do you make, how do you make the painting or the image relate to the to the performance? Uh, they have very different durational aspects. The, the painting or the or the image is going to be in the gallery all the time. The performers are going to come and go. Um, and I'm interested in how I can. Um, how I can make that situation um, n not necessarily one of absence, uh, but maybe how I can how I can make that situation interesting, and yeah, you'll notice this painting is not ac uh, it's an earlier version of it before I made the the measuring strip pink. I was also interested um, from, you know, so situating, situating myself, you know, back in the, specifically within painting, I was interested in these images. Um, I mean, I'm always, as a painter who works with images, I'm always looking for some, some way of making a painting based on a photograph that is, um, I mean, paintings are, in, are, are inaccurate, right? I mean, you can make a photorealistic painting and then it's accurate. But m most paintings aren't photorealistic. Um, and so there's always like, there's gonna be a bit less detail, there's gonna be a bit, little bit less clarity in a painting. And what I wanna do, what I wanted to do with these paintings is make that productive and interesting. So, so by which I mean, they're like a little bit of everything to me, these paintings. Like they're a little bit landscape because I use that, that um, I don't know what you call, uh, just paper backdrop that has that sort of curve to it. So in a painting that reads as a kind of distant horizon maybe, um, they're a little bit still life uh, because of the scale and obviously because it's a small object. And then you know there's the, the presence of a figure but in this really kind of truncated form. So I like this this situating of the image in between um, different categories of images. And I think I, I, think I also, uh, you know, I, I wound up abstracting the sculptures a little bit and turning them into, into gesture, into a kind of gestural thing in the paintings. Which, which I was happy with. Okay, so moving on to other objects in the show. Um, <coughs> um, sorry, <laughs> my hand's bouncing around here. I was also interested in, in the idea of, of arte povera as a, as a arte povera, Italian word for poor art, um, coming out of the 1960s. And I was interested in, in using that as a, um, as a way of thinking about the history of the West, you know that the thing could, it, the thing could be a kind of prop in a Western movie, maybe, but it's also an artwork. It looks old. It's made out of wood. Um, so that that's kind of where this piece came out of. Um, the gallery space is large. That space where I show the work. So there was there was a lot of like little areas that I could do different things with. Um, See the same painting there. Um, this, to my knowledge, is the f first time truck nuts have been used in the sculpture. Truck nuts are uh, these bulls, <laughs> fake bulls' testicles. <laughs> um, you know, and I, you know, I mentioned earlier this kind of um, sub theme of masculinity running through this. So it, it's it's stated fairly plainly. <laughs> it's fairly plainly in this work. Um, in relation to this bull rider, and the bull rider also, you know, when I talked about the the uh, the animal as a kind of gesture, 
um, that becomes very um, forced to the to the to the fore in this piece. Okay, so there's another view of the exhibition, and now you can see how the you know there was that funny wall separating the space, which which I was pretty happy in the end with the way it allowed me to play with the space behind the wall and in front of the wall. And it was kind of this little sort of illicit, you know, you round the corner and you have these like testicles hanging off the, from the ceiling and I don't know, it seemed like an interesting way of using that space. So they're the same collages that are downstairs. They're actually, yeah, they're right underneath that truck nut sculpture <laughs> as well. Um, so it, that's like the little sort of like creepy space, which I think is why I called it the creep. Um, so I said it's an excerpt. Um, the full performance was similar to this one. It was about 15 minutes, uh, but the video is five minutes. I've never seen these before. No. Nope. I've seen Remington before. Yeah. They look pretty good, though. Yeah. They really were packed up well. Yeah. A little bit dusty. <laughs> Do you have anything from before in your report? No, it doesn't say too much. There was a little bit of damage. Got a couple of cracks. Lethbridge was built on a bed of coal. Many worked on farms or clearing land, often in the townships. Felton noted the usual wages given in the townships to good men experienced in country work or logging are from $12 to $14 per month. For this child, the I'm okay, you're not okay position is a life-saving decision. The tragedy for himself and for society is that he goes through life refusing to look inward. Europeans who contract for a year are usually given seven to ten dollars per month. <laughs> Mr. Scott, I told you to cover that flank! Oh, I'm sorry, sir. From now on, you don't scratch until I itch. Is that clear? Godliness is in league with riches. It is only to the moral man that wealth comes. Material prosperity makes the nation sweeter. More joyous, more unselfish, more Christ-like. Of course, contemporary historians snigger because that was what the boys in the endowed pews wanted to hear. Rites with a faint distillate of Calvinist salvation. Honey, your pants are dirty. Get up. What were you doing on the ground? Just cooling and relaxing. Sorry. It's okay, I've got it. Did you feed the cat? The cat? Yeah. No. I didn't. We should go back. No, it's been Let's like, go home. It hasn't, it's been 20 minutes since we left. It's I know, like, but we're not gonna be home until like six o'clock. What is this? That's a bag of coal. What's it doing in an art gallery? You made one of the most heroic marches in history. I am sure the people of this country will understand and will agree when they hear the facts. The people? Who will 
tell the people? Who will tell the people about Fort Robinson? I will. I promise you. Now, will you take the gamble? Yeah. Really not much to report. You know, overall, everything seems good. The present is a moment in time where we lower our expectations of the future or abandon some of our dear traditions of the past. In order to pass through the narrow gate of the here and now. Yeah, I think we're done here. Right. Um, yeah, the uh, apologies for the audio problem with, with the recording. Um, so that's about it for my talk. I'm just going to leave off um, the next show that's coming up, uh, Kamloops Art Gallery. The reason I bring it up is because it, it's going to it's going to provide me with an opportunity to um, I'm going to work with those two uh, with those two Remington sculptures uh, one more time. Uh, in a very different context again. Um, so that's coming up in, uh, in spring 2015. So that's it. Um, thanks. Thank you.